Welcome to Hochoka Podcast. Those who tell the stories rule the world goes a proverb attributed to Hopi Native Americans. Indeed, storytelling has the power to transmit culture, teach, heal, and reflect. For Native Americans, that power has survived generations despite attempts at repression and assimilation. Hello, Mitaki Api. Welcome to Hochoka here at the center of St. Joseph's Indian School's campus. I am Scott Wooster. Today we visit with Lily Mendoza, cherished Lakota Unchi, founder of the Red Ribbon Skirt Society and the force behind Word Carrier Trading Post. Word Carrier is an online source for Native American, multicultural, and indigenous literature. We first connected with Lily some four years ago as a partner to help stock our summer bookmobile with Native American books. Lily joins us today to discuss storytelling's power and introduce us to some fantastic indigenous women poets. Lily, welcome to Hochoka again. Thanks for having me. Um, I guess I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about where where my beginnings came from as far as literature. Please. Um, and I've been in the book business for probably 20 years. Okay. Okay. Um, and as I began to get involved in, in the distribution of books, um, what I kind of was seeing and finding out is that access to literature was really difficult for reservations. Mm -hmm. Okay. That was one of the big issues. And so um, through the bookstores that I initially worked through, which was Borders Bookstore when that was in place. Oh, yeah. Um, and then I worked for a short time at Prairie Edge. That was one of the things I was trying to implement and say, we've got to do Native American book fairs mm -hmm. so that our communities can have access to literature. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that for about 15 years, going on the road uh, yeah. and doing book fairs. And so it's kind of nice to know that um, they're doing that here, um, here at um, St. Joe's School, that they have the bookmobile. So that's, that's really great. Um, and I know that they came to me a few years ago um, talking about we really need to get, use Native American literature and community. Mm -hmm. So that, that was really a good and exciting thing for me. And they also kind of helped me kind of back off on my traveling a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, besides COVID, when COVID hit, I couldn't go into schools anymore. Right, okay? right. Um, a big part of, you know, I did have a bookstore, um, and it was called Birdcage Bookstore there in Rapid City. Okay. And so what I really tried to do and create is a space where people could come in, feel comfortable, authors, writers, um, especially Native American writers, that there was a place they could go that we really understood and we um, valued, valued their writing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one thing that we did there. And one of the things that we hosted was a Free the Bird poetry. Okay. Okay. And so that's kind of, as I began to do this, I had large numbers of Native American peoples come in to listen to poetry. And it was interesting to see that our people do love poetry, right? Mm -hmm. And we do know about poets out there. So that kind of was the beginning of that. And so that's really kind of why I want to talk about poetry today, because we really need to recognize those poets that are out there. Excellent. Right. Excellent. And to that end, we're going to talk about three in particular, right. correct? Mm -hmm. And and these are three that you suggested uh, for our conversation today. Right. One is uh, Dr. Jerry Mendoza Gutwine. Am I saying that right? Sure. Okay, cool. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, and she's a member of, of the uh, Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe and Mexican American. Mm -hmm. We have Lydia Whirlwind Soldier, well known uh, in the state as Sichangu Lakota author, and Joy Harjo, who's Muscogee. Mm -hmm. And all of those women, I think, have been recognized for their contributions to uh, contemporary Native American poetry. Right. Yep. And two of them are right here in South Dakota, mm -hmm. of course. Um, Jerry Mendoza Goodwine shares a name with you, and I understand she's your sister. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, about her, and then... Uh, and maybe share the tribute that Jerry uh, wrote in a prose poem. Okay. Right. Kind of goes to the essence yeah, of Yeah, um, you know, my sister though. Jerry's been, she's been writing for a really long time. And um, she eventually went to the East Coast, um, taught at um, a university there. But she always, she always wrote. Mm -hmm. And she has, she has journals upon journals. She's keeping our stories alive within our family. Yeah. Okay. Um, and one of the things while she's doing that, I think that other uh, Native American family, uh, other Native American families, can connect with those stories. Mm -hmm. Okay, because mm -hmm. especially for those of us natives that are living on the reservation, you know, grew up in the time of assimilation, boarding schools, and all those sorts of things, we all can relate to those stories. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, and then also, you know, just to mention, it's just not only that, we also have a background of uh, being Mexican American. Okay. So that's a whole nother um, background of information that she's um, archiving, I guess you would say, for our family. You know, yeah. those stories that um, experiences we've had. And we can read her poetry, and she shares her poetry with me quite often. I go, oh, yeah, I remember that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's very relatable, um, and, and it's just not about one culture. It's about two cultures. And I think that most of the, the poets that you're going to read that I'll share with you today, it's just not from one perspective or from one culture, mm -hmm. too, as well. So so that that's what's really interesting, you know, about that. Um, I know that she had we had mentioned that she had written... Um, a couple of different poems, and one of them was, um, it says, Her hands and arms floated as she conducted her way through story. Netted hair escaped in strands and wisped above her. I watched her wrinkled curl and stretch their way around words and smiles. And so as I'm reading that, that really is about our grandmother. Mm -hmm. And if you can kind of picture that, um, you know, as a grandmother sitting there and talking to you and and I'm I do this a lot with my I talk with my hands and I do remember my grandmother really talking with her hands and her hair net and her hair you know some of it was coming out and all those sorts of things so that's that's the way that that my sister saw her mm -hmm. and I see her like that too yeah but I can't put that into words right right so so that's kind of what she does um, the other thing we had kind of talked about is um, ghost stories or spooky stories Okay, um, and those are the things that my mother used to share. And I think in conversations that I had with her, it was her way of sharing stories and also getting us to listen to what our surroundings were, whether they were spooky stories or not. I mean, we all have great spooky stories. Mm -hmm. And I tell you what, in Native American culture, there's a lot of stories oh, yeah. out there, you know. Um, and so that I think that was her way of kind of gathering us together, you know, in the evening and talking about those stories. And, you know, pretty soon we're ready to go to bed because we're scared to death. Um, and um, so, you know, sharing those kinds of stories with us, it was entertaining for, for us, you know. Um, and then the other thing is a lot of her sharing stories and sitting down there and talking about, you know, her, her mother and her great grandmother and when we're talking about our great grandmother, which I'll read, a, I'll read something about her. Um, you know, she was she died in 1957. I was born in 1958. But when I read through this, um, I know her. Yeah, I know her yeah. and I see her. And that's really comforting. It's not only I mean, in cultures to know and see that is very, very comforting because you kind of know where you come from. Absolutely. And who you are. Absolutely. Right? Um, so I'm going to read about Julie Boucher Roussa. Okay. Okay. A little girl in braids, the daughter of a Frenchman and Lakota woman, whose mother died and took all ties to Chief Spotted Tail. She watched the Frenchmen trade with the Indians. She held the old China doll in camp, its blue marble eyes showing her way to a Minnesota convent school. Nuns, teachings remain a lifetime of rosaries. While she played Indians during a summer retreat, a stray arrow plucked out her, night, her right eye. Her vision trapped in a marble eye, china doll eye, she wore on special occasions like her wedding day. Towering above her seated husband, wifely hand rested on his shoulder, she posed and stared at the lens of future generations, a drooping lid, the only sign of one-eyed vision. The eye in her youth was her friend. In later years, beauty lost to babies, ranch work and family. The eye became a bad fit. She stored it in a glass jar, an ornament on the vanity table. The white bandana patch protected a sightless socket. Widowed young, she went on, labored a living out of gumbo under endless spray sky. Earthen hands nurtured food from the soil, delivered her grandchildren. She helped them take life's first breath, saw all life as she held each child in large hands, the drooping lid, her only sign of one-eyed vision. Ooh. Mm -hmm. And that's how we knew, that's how we knew our, our um, great-grandma. Mm -hmm. Pictures of her with a bandana over one eye because she mm -hmm. lost her eye, mm -hmm. you know, playing, playing outside. And yeah. she did have that marble eye in there. Um, and so that's how we remember her and we see her in pictures. And she did those, those things. You know, she had helped give birth to lots of babies. 
Um, and she cooked for the community, mm-hmm. you know. She helped in community. And I think from, you know, just the stories that are being shared through poetry, um, those are the kinds of things I have taken on as far as cooking for community, making sure everybody's fed. Mm-hmm. But those, sh- those stories are passed down right. through poetry. Mm-hmm. Very powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's turn from Jerry. Thank you. Let's mm-hmm. turn uh, to Lydia Whirlwind Soldier, and she has published a lot of essays and poems, mm-hmm. um, and they capture uh, Native American thought from the time of arrival of Lewis and Clark until today. So there's a particular right. one that you and you yeah. and I had kind of zeroed in, or you had zeroed in on before mm-hmm. we started survival songs. Can you share that and comment on it? Because it kind of opens up what that work has been like for, for her to for be her. able to share that as a poet. Yeah, you know, she, um, um, I, I know Lydia, I know, I've known her for a really long time, and she's she's been a teacher, she's been an educator, mm-hmm. okay? So I can't even imagine to have her as a teacher in the classroom, right? right? Um, what an honor it would be to have mm-hmm. her there. Um, and I think that um, Lydia has been around for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And so I think, especially in the state of South Dakota and other poets on reservations, she has led the way for that, mm-hmm. for poetry. Absolutely. You know, so um, very well respected. And, you know, one of the things is I think that, too, is she draws from from her memory and her thoughts and her experiences is the boarding school days, mm-hmm. you know, because she was in a boarding school. Um, and often I, I see her um, on Facebook and she will post stories about boarding school. Mm-hmm. And um, so, so we know that maybe in some of the, some of the poems that she does write, um, that comes from her soul, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, it comes from her experiences and where she's going and where she hopes other people that have gone through the experience, where, where are they going to go? Mm-hmm. They're going to join her star people. And so I guess that's one of the reasons I, I chose one of her poems, Star People, um, because I really want to speak to that, especially if we're, we're also talking about and have talked about MMIW. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one of the things that, that we hope and pray for is that um, that they do go to the star people. Mm-hmm. And that's where they are, and they're, and they're safe, um, even though we know some are probably waiting for that. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. when I say waiting for that is for their families to find them and do ceremony and then send them on their way. Mm-hmm. So we have a lot of soul, lost souls out yeah. there, really, yeah. is what we do. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read um, a poem called Star People. Please. Um, it's from her book, Survival Songs. Okay. Okay. Um, star People. Lakota legends tell us we were star people first. Ancient stardust. Ina, the breath of creation, traveling to unknown destinations. Through vast galaxies, a spark of energy. Our DNA riding eagle wings. Trevos hitch to DNA horses. Weaving throughout the heavens, riding solar winds. Wandering crimson star campfires, leaving soundless footprints in stardust, moonlight, and northern lights. We found our connection to our beautiful Unchi Maka millions of years ago. These thoughts linger in my mind as I gaze at the infinite universe. I feel small and insignificant at the, time, at the same time blessed. I feel a bond with nature and the universe in all its miracles. So I'm reading through this poem, and it's like I'm I'm really looking at that because I can really feel it, Mm -hmm. you know. Especially when we're especially when we're out there, you know, at nighttime, um, if we look up into look look up into the the stars, um, the Big Dipper, in relation to ship to our MMIW. Um, there is a star up there designated to our women. Oh, okay. Okay, within yeah. that Big Dipper. Yep. And within that Big Dipper, all you know, if you look at the the stars, there's seven, which represent the seven women, our seven women across the universe. Okay, and so you visually can imagine that, and you can see it, and we are, we can all I think relate to that to that moment that she's that she is speaking mm-hmm. about, and especially mm-hmm. I think I talked earlier at some time DNA. It's part of our DNA, all of those things that have happened in our history mm-hmm. um, that is in our DNA. And, and we, we can't control that because that was our lives and that were the lives of our grandparents. And our, you, know, you know, hundreds of years, these same, our people went through that. So it's in our DNA. So I think when she's talking about this, I think she's hitting it right on the nose with this. Mm-hmm. You know, even with the horses, our sacred horses as well, you know, they went to battle. 
Mm-hmm. You know, they went to battle with our warriors and with our women. And I, I, I love that she mentions the DNA in the horses. Yeah. I think that's yeah. wonderful. I think that's really, really wonderful. Um, so that, that's Lydia. I love it. Excellent. Powerful. Um, should we move on to the third? Sure. Should we go to, uh, we can go to Joy Harjo, uh, who, who's actually an internationally known performer. Uh, she's a writer, and she is the right. 23rd Poet Laureate in the United States. Uh, tell us a little bit, in your own words, about her. Okay. Well, I met Joy um, Harjo probably, I'm thinking about, maybe 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had invited her to come to the National Indian Education Conference. And so that was the first time I ever heard her read and, and, and watch her move through, through crowds of people. Um, I mean, she moves people spread for, I mean, like the water spread for her yeah. to walk through kind yeah. of thing. And um, she's very, no, actually, I saw her twice, actually, because she was here for the book festival. Um, very, she's very, very humble, very humble individual. And she really speaks from the heart. And for her to be chosen as the poet laureate in the United States, um, it, it's about time somebody was selected as a Native American. Mm-hmm. So that's so that's really wonderful. A woman um, and a Native American. Right. Yeah. So that yeah. that's great. And she's also a musician. You know, mm-hmm. she's also plays the saxophone and she sings and and all of those sorts of things. And even in those moments when she's performing, she also conveys that message within her music. And it's wonderful see, to see a Native woman that can do that. Mm-hmm. You know, to share her music. Uh, to her people and to you know people across the world, um, so she has she has a lot of books out there. She really does have a lot of literature, and um, I I make sure that I keep keep her books in stock at my, my online store as well too. So um, so one of her books is Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings, um, and so I'd like to read something um, a poem from this book, and um, I guess for those of you that are listening, um, to, you know to listen. Um, intently to listen to her words and to know and understand that probably you're going to recognize her story as one of your own stories and something that has happened into your life. Um, The title of it is, I am not ready to die yet. My death peers at the world through a plumian tree. The tree looks out over the neighbor's house to the Pacific. A blue water spirit commands this part of the earth mind without question. It rules from the kingdom of secrets and tremendous fishes. I was once given to the water. My ashes will return there, but I am not ready to die yet. This morning, I carry the desire to live inside my thigh. It pulses there, a banyan, a mirrored bird, or a young, impatient wind. Until I am ready to fly again over the pungent flowers, over the sign and the drilling workmen making a mess in the yard of the house next door. It is endless, the map of eternity. Beware the water monster that lives at the borders of doubt. He can swallow everything whole, all the delectable mangoes, dreams, and even the most faithful of planets. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, reading through that, maybe listening, that really is reflective of, I, I imagine... You know, just being, of course, she lived in Hawaii for a really long time. That's you know? where she's looking right. out at the Pacific. Okay. Right. Um, and if you can imagine that, you know, even us standing and looking out at the water out here, the Missouri, mm-hmm. um, at the, um, the different waters that are out in our reservations and on our land, we know that we all do that. Mm-hmm. You know, get up in the morning and, and have our coffee and look out. And even if it's not water, if it's just the dry prairie, mm-hmm. listening to the, the metal arcs um, and, uh, you know, just the animals that are out there and, and seeing them. And that's very reflective of what we all see and we all experience. And it's a little bit more, um, especially for Native people, we're very much more in tuned to that mm-hmm. um, because, you know, we believe that... Um, we're all related, mm-hmm. you know, to the plants and to the animals. And so it becomes a little bit more personal to mm-hmm. us. And so that we believe and we see in those things and that um, we're, all, we're all related. We're all one. Yeah. And so as we do that, we, um, we respect that mm-hmm. and we become part of that. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, just say that 
um, this year, the Joy and Caldecott medalist, mm -hmm. Michaela Goad, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the name, G-O-A-D-E, uh, published a book for children that's a beautiful celebration of life, and it's called Remember. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a drawing to give away five of those books for our listeners. And if you want to right. show, hold that up for uh, mm -hmm. the camera, this one here. Right. Okay. Um, and so we'll have a drawing, a giveaway, five of these books for our listeners. And you have the copy there. What do you want listeners to know about that beautiful piece of uh, children's literature? You know, well, I think, um, you know, the illustrations are wonderful. And that's always a good thing for um for young young adults, young young people to know to understand, you know the literature or the the pictures, and I think probably too. I mean, they're like so beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. I think one thing that that many of the listeners or readers need to understand is that not only are we writers, but we're also artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and to combine that together is a beautiful, wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. For our listeners, you also want to know that to be entered in the drawing for one of those five copies. Uh, send your name and address to hochoka at stjoe.org. So that's going to look like all lowercase h-o-c-h-o-k-a at stjo.org. And uh, like I said, I could listen to this all day. This is this is worthwhile. And I, it makes me reflect a little bit, too, that Working with kids over the year, I over the years, I always think that educationally, one of the best things you can do for kids is to get books in their hands right, when they're yeah. just little ones. You know, when you talk about that, um, you know, when I first started going out into the different reservations and doing Native American book fairs, you know, families were so excited because they saw they saw their relatives on the covers. It was good for them to be able to see that. They felt good about seeing their people in those books. Mm -hmm. um, you know, although the, we are a, a culture that is really about storytelling, well, uh, it's it's at a point now where yes I mean it's been for a while that our stories are in books and that's okay mm -hmm. that that's really okay because sometimes um, we're losing a lot of our storytellers mm -hmm. so if we can have them written down um, that that's for generations to be able to see so yes literature is very important for children if if there's anybody out there that doesn't understand what the bookmobile is. I've been here 30 years, and for 30 years they've been sending the bookmobile out on the road. It uh, basically looks like a giant ice cream truck, and now it's a trailer uh, pulled behind a, a truck, and they go around to the different towns and communities around the state and um, invite kids and adults to come in and check out the books and have conversations. And it is, it is such a good idea. It's one of the better ones I've, I've seen. In, in a number of years, get books in people's hands. Well, thank you for everything that, that you're doing. Thank you for making my day by, <laughs> by reading uh, poetry here. It's so, so good to hear that. And that those are, you pick three very good poets and uh, complex women, you know, right. who have yep. a lot of different, different uh, um, areas of their lives that they're talented in, and as well as you do too. We've had some good conversation here today. So Wopila, again, mm -hmm. for being here. Thank you to our viewers who joined us here today at Hochoka at the center of St. Joseph's Indian School campus, where we talk about issues that are central to Native American education today. Until next time, stay centered.